Welcome to Medicare for All Explained. This podcast will enlighten our listeners and dispel the distortions that surround Medicare for All. Medicare for All Explained is produced in collaboration with Physicians for a National Health Program and is hosted and produced by Joe Sparks. I'm your host, Joe Sparks. This is episode 84, Puerto Rico's History of Single Payer. My guest, Carlo Bosques, is a medical student in Puerto Rico. He was born and raised in Puerto Rico and did his undergraduate degree at Johns Hopkins University, majoring in molecular and cellular biology. While at Johns Hopkins, he served as a volunteer at a clinic that served undocumented patients. That experience helped him to realize how inseparable health and policy were. While pursuing his medical degree in Puerto Rico, Mr. Boskis leads a group of medical students in Project Arbona that supports establishing a universal healthcare system in Puerto Rico. Mr. Boskis describes how Puerto Rico did have a single payer healthcare system, which is an often forgotten part of its history that is rarely mentioned in the United States. Carlo Boskis, welcome to Medicare for All Explained. Thanks, thanks for having me, really appreciate it. Please tell us what project you're working on. So uh, basically I'm uh, currently part of Proyecto Arbona, which translates to English uh, as Project Arbona or Arbona Project, which is basically an organization of medical students that seeks to advance here in Puerto Rico the dialogue, the public discourse regarding universal health care. We're looking to push uh, that sort of system here on the island, given that, you know, we have so many people in Puerto Rico that uh, lack health care coverage and so many people that have, you know, health care coverage, but it, it's not of quality. It's not something that really allows them to get that service they need. So Proyecto Arbona basically seeks to create that dialogue in the public find acceptance with political movements as well, you know, push it into the mainstream dialogue. And it's basically right now an educational endeavor. It's also a political endeavor. You know, we're, we're meeting with uh, politicians from all the parties on the island to to sort of explain what our ideas are. So that's basically what we are in our name. Uh, Project Arbona, Project Arbona uh, comes in honor of Dr. Guillermo Arbona, which was the Secretary of Health Puerto Rico back in 1957. That's when he started uh, Secretary of Health. And he was the person that established the single payer system, the universal health care system that we used to have in Puerto Rico. And we're trying to carry on his legacy. You know, it's it's a forgotten legacy. It's not something that's really talked about nowadays in, in Puerto Rico, much less in the United States. But uh, we're trying to, you know, carry his legacy and and, and hopefully establish a universal health care system eventually in, in the island once again. Yeah, we're working on getting one in the United <laughs> States, but you bring up a very interesting point. So you said that Puerto Rico had a single payer healthcare system. Could you talk a little about the history, about when that started and when it ended, and maybe just some of the health outcomes? Yeah, so so I think the... Uh... Interesting thing here, right, is that Puerto Rico has been a colony for its entire existence, right? You know, ever since uh, the first settlers came here from Spain, uh, we used to have, you know, uh, indigenous uh, people here, native people, uh, the Tainos, they were called. Uh, they lived here, but, you know, the Spaniards came and, and, and arrived to the island. And we have this very long history of colonialism where we really haven't been anything else besides a colony. So under Spain up until 1898, which was when the the, the Spanish American War, yeah, that's that's when that took place, and uh, that's when uh, Puerto Rico basically was transferred from Spain to the United States, and uh, it basically created this sort of issue in in the United States where it's like we don't want to accept this place as a state, you know, we don't want to bring it into the union we also don't want to let go of puerto rico because you know back in, in the day it used to have strategic objectives it was in the caribbean and during mm-hmm. world war one it was an important base world war ii as well so it, it, it had its purpose but obviously given the differences in culture and 
you know, the, the racism that, you know, frankly kind of existed back in the day in a lot stronger way than it may, may exist right now in a lot more overt way. Uh, so basically, Puerto Rico was uh, kept as this sort of uh, colony where there, sure, it was quote unquote part of the United States, but it really wasn't part of the United States. And I'm giving this context because, right, it's relevant to the healthcare system. And I, I'm getting to that. But basically, given these circumstances, you have sort of this, this island, this uh, colony that already had its own quote unquote. Uh, healthcare system, and I wouldn't really call it a healthcare system because it was very rudimentary. You know what you had really was just a few charity hospitals here and there, a few institutions that were really managed by you know churches, the Catholic Church, stuff like that. So it really wasn't something of quality, and you can't really call it a system. It was more of just a a couple of, of of charity initiatives here and there. This was back in the day under Spanish rule, and then when the United States uh, came and you know took the island as as a territory. That's when things started to change uh, a little bit. So it's interesting to see how the United States healthcare system evolved. You know, it, it had its own trajectory and then how the healthcare system in Puerto Rico kind of evolved as well simultaneously. So uh, mostly for the most part, you know, we, we didn't really have a healthcare system, as I mentioned, up until sort of the 1920s when there was we begin to see a lot more interaction between the mainland and Puerto Rico, uh, a lot more exchange. Before that, what we really were seeing was just, you know, Puerto Rico's over here, the United States is over here. We're not really intermingling. It's just a piece of land with some people in it, but that's about it. Already in the 1920s, you start to have that sort of like uh, uh, interaction and, and between, you know, people in Puerto Rico, they're visiting the United States. And you start to uh, have these funds, these federal funds coming into the island as well, investing into the development, uh, basically what would become that universal healthcare system that we had. Uh, slowly, little by little, between 1940 to 1950s, around there, we st there was a lot of federal funds flowing into the island, due in, in, in large part to the New Deal, right, from the Roosevelt administration. There were a lot of funds that, that came into the island and allowed the development of a lot of healthcare infrastructure. So the interesting thing here is, to keep in mind, is that there was a lot of public infrastructure here in Puerto Rico that was developed when it comes to healthcare. But in the United States, you actually don't really see that investment in, into public infrastructure. And that's because over here uh, in Puerto Rico, there was a strong focus in, in developing that purposely developing that public infrastructure. You really had a, a, a lot more control from that sort of more progressive left wing of, of the Roosevelt administration. They were actually the ones that were, that were dealing with a lot of affairs in Puerto Rico. And um, the interesting thing is, you know, you have this sort of healthier system that's kind of, it's not fully formed. It's not really a system yet. It's just a patchwork of a lot of different public providers, but they all respond to different agencies, be it federal, be it local, and they weren't really integrated into what would be called the system. And it really wasn't complete. You still didn't have a lot of hospitals or, or clinics that were accessible to the majority of the population. This started to change mainly in 1940s and 50s when uh, what is called the Sistema Arbona, when that was established. The Sistema Arbona or the Arbona system, it was established in part by the doctor Guillermo Arbona, which was, as I mentioned, the Secretary of Health of Puerto Rico Back in 1957, but he was working in, in, the, sec in the Department of Health of Puerto Rico uh, since the 1940s as well, uh, developing basically this, this integrated healthcare system. It was a regionalized healthcare system where you divide Puerto Rico into different regions and you, depending on the necessities of each region, right, you would uh, assign uh, a hospital, for example, a regional hospital. Where you would build the hospital using mostly federal funds and some local funds as well. And that's when you really have the development of that uh, public provision of healthcare services and that universal healthcare system. So it was basically uh, free when you're using the service itself. So you could visit any clinic, be it a primary care clinic, which were called the CDTs in Spanish, Clinica de Diagnóstico y Tratamiento, in English, uh, the diagnostic and treatment clinics, which were basically primary care centers, but they had a lot of services integrated, including actually emergency services. So they were, a lot of them were open 24 hours and every single municipality on the island had a CDT established. 
And this was uh, this was basically the, the the culmination of a lot of years of of development of this infrastructure finally coming together to create what is this integrated universal healthcare system. And the vast majority of people in Puerto Rico, more than eighty percent of the people in the island, used this system to receive their health care. There was a very small private sector, which was only available to people that had the resources to pay, right? But mostly the, the vast majority of healthcare services were delivered under this system. And it was actually very successful from the 1940s, which was when it was beginning to be established. You had this sort of explosion of, of, of provision of healthcare services, uh, this heavy focus on preventive services as well. But basically, you have this sort of integration of public health as well into the healthcare system. So that's something that we don't really see uh, nowadays in the healthcare system here in Puerto Rico or in the United States. So you have this increase in life expectancies from the 1940s to the 1970s, where you see an increase in life expectancy of around 26 years, which actually resulted in Puerto Rico being the 14th country in the world when it comes to life expectancy. So this was a huge leap, a huge jump in, in what was essentially a very poor island for the majority of its, of its existence. I mean, right now, you know, we have 500 years of history behind us, right? It's only been 100 years under American colonialism. But it, it really isn't until recently where you see that sun spike in healthcare outcomes because of that public healthcare system. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist anymore because we had the slow, gradual process of privatization that, that took place uh, in Puerto Rico, uh, because as I mentioned, there was a lot of, uh, you know, intercommunication, a lot of dialogue between the United States and Puerto Rico in the 1920s. But by the time you reach, uh, you know, as time progresses, you have more and more exchange of ideas. And slowly, these uh, sort of perspectives from the United States regarding healthcare, you know, the privatization of healthcare services, sort of seeps into the discourse here in Puerto Rico and that combined with local deficiencies when it comes to actually managing this public healthcare system resulted in the the slow privatization that culminated in 1993. So they privatized nearly all of the CDTs, which were the primary healthcare clinics. Uh, They privatized most of the hospitals as well. And now what you have is, is a very similar healthcare system to what you have in the United States. So that's basically a brief rundown of, you know, I, I include a Puerto Rico history, Puerto Rican history in there, United States history, and uh, up until what we have right now. So that's, that's, that's a rundown. Well, if you have a healthcare system similar to the United States, you have my sympathy. Um, <laughs> you mentioned that you went from a public system to a private system. You said it was a gradual process, but at what point did you start going to the private system? And at what point would you say that you had, what year would you say that you had mostly a private system and the public health system really wasn't there anymore? Yeah. So, so, you know, short answer, right? The definite uh, point where we can say, we can point and say, yeah, this is when Sistema Bona, the Bona system kind of went away. It was in 1993. That's when uh, the full-blown privatization took place. And that's when Puerto Rico switched completely to the U.S. model of healthcare delivery, right? Where it's mainly private providers and people start, you know, purchasing these private plans, et cetera. So that, that, that really, that process finalized, concluded, right? I could say back in 1993, but it really started back in the late 1970s. And this was due to a combination of factors. And they're really related to, to the colonial status that, that Puerto Rico has. So uh, as I mentioned, Puerto Rico has, you know, it's separate, distinct culture. It's geographically separated from uh, the United, you know, mainland, continental United States. And uh, due to these differences and, and, and sort of the rejection to the idea of Puerto Rico being part of the United States, there were a couple of Supreme Court decisions called the insular cases, uh, which not only affected Puerto Rico, affected all the territories, you know, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Guam, that basically said that uh, the people in the territories are, you know, aliens. They are not part of the culture of the United States. They do not represent our values and they cannot you know, take responsibility for themselves. So we have to, you know, sort of, we can't include them 
right? We can't bring them into the union. They can't be a say. We reserve the right to basically pick and choose what rights we give them and what rights we don't. So the constitution doesn't really apply to the territories according to these insular cases. And this, this isn't really my opinion. You can look it up on the internet and you're going to see that they were effectively based on very explicit racist assumptions uh, about the people that lived in Puerto Rico, Guam, the Virgin Island. Basically, these these decisions said that that the, the United States Congress can decide what they want to do with the territories. So that's why we also have such distinct territories. Not all the territories have the same sort of rights. Supreme Court decisions, for example, don't apply to some territories. They do apply here to Puerto Rico. So it's it's this weird, you know, uh, mixture of different models of governments, right? Basically, you know, I'm bringing this into the conversation because this results then in an unequal assignment of funds when it comes to federal programs such as medicare and medicaid that's you know that's the reason i was mentioning the insular cases to begin with you know based on these racist assumptions basically the united states government can then say yeah we don't have to give the territories the same amount of funds for medicare and medicaid the thing is um back in the day you know back in the 1970s uh, where we used to have the, the Sistema Arbona, you know, from the 1940s up to the 1970s, uh, you have this interesting development back in the, in the mid 1960s, late 1960s, which is the established development of Medicare and Medicaid, right? So this solved a, a, a bit of a problem in the United States. This was a positive development, one could say, for the United States, the mainland continent of the United States. Puerto Rico, that already had this healthcare system, this simply presented sort of an alternate path this sort of opening to establish this private sector that did not exist before. And all of a sudden you have this fragmentation of the of the Arbona system, this universal healthcare coverage system that you see have. Uh, you have this sort of fragmentation where now people can go to these private providers and the private providers could charge a lot more for the services that they're offering. So you create this private sector, all of a sudden it starts growing. You have less funds invested in the public system and a lot of them are diverted into the private system and obviously this creates a large financial interest for this private sector and they're gonna fight you know tooth and nail to make sure that they are able to keep that private sector healthy and alive well you know they're healthy we're not but besides the point but basically you know they're 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 fighting for that and uh Basically, what that resulted in was a, a, a limitation. They actively advocated for a limitation of Medicaid funds specifically. Why? Because the majority of people in Puerto Rico were, you know, under way under the federal poverty line. So a lot of them, the vast majority, would apply, uh, would qualify for Medicaid. And so what they said was, no, we don't want to strengthen this public system. We don't want them to have, you know, unlimited funds. So unlike the states, the local, uh, the association of of doctors here at the local medical association, the, the Puerto Rican Medical Association, basically went to the United States Congress. They said, hey, put a limitation to Medicaid, put a cap. First of all, you got to put a cap to the funds. There were a couple of million dollars, you know, which back in the, obviously, you know, this was increased later on, but the, there was a cap, the Medicaid funds, which is not, you know, not seen in the States. And you also have also a, a fixed percentage of local contribution. Uh, I'm not going to, you know, go into all the technicisms and all that sort of stuff technical aspects, but basically four states, the mainland continental United States, they pay less for Medicaid in their state and they have a bigger contribution from the federal government. That's how Medicaid works. Here in Puerto Rico, it's fixed. You know, we have that number fixed. It's uh, right now it's 55%. A couple of years ago, it was 50%. The Affordable Care Act did a tremendous favor and made it a 55% contribution from the federal government. It's a 5% difference, which you know didn't really make much of a dent, to be honest. But basically, you have this limitation of funds, and so you have this weakening, this debilitation of, of the healthcare system on the island. And this coupled with, you know, uh, the spread of more conservative ideas regarding uh, the, the government and the public sector, you have this push to start privatizing it. And this starts in 1979 with one party, another party comes into power. All these parties kind of imbibed it. They just absorbed that sort of ideology. It doesn't matter if it was one party or the other, two main parties here on the island. They they pushed the same agenda, privatization. And so basically, that's it all culminated in 1993, you know, under Bill Clinton and the local governor, Pedro Rosselló, where we privatized basically every single 
the vast majority, rather, the vast majority of, of CDTs, hospitals, and stuff like that here in the island. And that was basically the end of that public system. So I would like to clarify something. I don't think we made this clear, but essentially Puerto Rico, before it had its privatized system, had a single-payer healthcare system. Yep, uh, essentially, that's that's what we had here, yeah. And based on what you were saying, it seemed that the doctors and hospitals were run by the government. So it was like the NHS system in Great Britain. It was very similar in part because it was inspired by by the, the NHS system, yeah. So you had this single-payer system. It became privatized. Have you noticed any difference in health outcomes between your public system and your privatized system? How do they compare? So uh, I think, you know, the, mo the most important thing to take into account was the improvement, right, that, that we saw under the, you know, single-payer system that you, we used to have in Puerto Rico. Uh, so as I mentioned, you know, from 1940 to 1970, you have this 26-year, you know, increase in life expen expectancy on the island. Back in the day, you know, we also didn't have that good of, of – data collection practices, we didn't really have a lot of metrics to begin with. So I'm mentioning that metric because in part, we really don't have a lot else to base it on. Definitely accessibility was a lot better, you know, uh, when this included uh, medications, they were also included uh, in the pharmacies uh, that were under the government as well and the CDTs, as I mentioned. So th this was a pretty comprehensive healthcare system. The, the situation is, right, once we have this privatiz uh, privatization process, you, you also have this exclusion of a large portion of people in the island that don't qualify then for Medicaid, but cannot afford private healthcare plans. And so that's when you, for the first time in a long time, you see this sort of big population uh, of people that have no coverage whatsoever. The problem in Puerto Rico back in the day and still today is that we really, at least, you know, let me not include myself or, or everybody else, right? The government really doesn't try to keep track of a lot of metrics. So even if they are actually required by the federal government, you're going to notice that a lot of the times Puerto Rico just doesn't report on important metrics. What we do know is that uh, when it, uh, compared to the United States, our current health system right now, you know, we, we have worse outcomes when it comes to child mortality. We have worse outcomes when it comes to, you know, life expectancy as well, if I'm not mistaken. So we haven't really seen that drastic improvement that actually might have continued with other countries, right? So you have other countries with, with single-payer systems and a heavy focus on, on public health as well and preventive services, which you don't have in our current system. And, and that's also very important, right? You know, you may have single-payer, but if you don't have that public health integrated, you don't have that preventive focus, uh, you won't really see that huge leap as you saw under the public system, the single-payer we had as well. So it's, it's important to integrate both of those aspects. But... Really, once you have the privatization, you don't have that public health aspect integrated anymore. You don't have as many public facilities because, as you can imagine, the vast majority of the population of Puerto Rico was poor. Therefore, it's not profitable. Therefore, the CDTs that were privatized weren't making a profit, so they shut down. So basically, you privatize them, and then they shut down because they weren't making a profit. That's the problem with you know having this private system where you don't really deliver care to the people that need it, you deliver it to the people that can pay. And so what what we used to be only 10% of the of the healthcare services on the island, private healthcare services were only 10% back in the day before the single payer system. All of a sudden the entire system was was had these different actors and agents trying to increase their profits and increase how much money they can make. And and so we really haven't seen that drastic increase. We haven't seen that, that, that continuity, that pattern of, of improvement. You have not seen it when you look at other countries with increased life expectancy around the world. Most of them, you know, also have that sort of system. And we unfortunately abandoned it. So, yeah. You have the same problem in the United States with Medicaid funding, even with the Affordable Care Act that offered to fund it. Some yeah. of the... Republican states or what are considered red states refuse to, which I've never understood. Yeah. Actually, do, do you happen to have, uh, I can't off the top of my head remember, but I, I'm pretty sure there was a state where they voted, they, they made a public referendum, right? Mm -hmm. They voted in favor of Medicaid expansion, and then they simply didn't. They just did not do it. Well, 
Interestingly enough, I live in Maryland now, but I'm originally from Missouri. Okay. And there may have been other states that did that, but Missouri was one of the states. I don't like the governor, but finally he said, you know, there were challenges. And finally he said it was the will of the people. He said, we have to do this because it's now in the Constitution. But they tried to avoid it, some of the legislatures. Okay. Yeah, that, that's, I, I read about that. Hell, I'm glad that they're going through with it, that Medicaid expansion. It's just impressive. It's, it's a popular policy. It's something that people need. It's, it's something that will help people. You know, a, a lot of the times in politics and, and, and government, it's kind of hard to, to be sure, you know, is this really going to help people or is this just politics? Is this just, you know, playing to my base? But when it comes to healthcare, it's one of those things that's it's very straightforward. Either you're helping people or not. And these sort of initiatives, be it Medicaid expansion, Medicare for all, hopefully, you know, establishing a single payer, this helps people. And, and it shouldn't be an issue of, of, you know, conservative, liberal, leftist or whatever. It should just be a common sense measure is, you know, let's just improve the quality of life. And so th this is basically the reason why I want to start this sort of dialogue between people in the United States, continental United States and people in Puerto Rico. You know, I'm, tr I'm trying to create this this dialogue between universal healthcare movements in the States and Puerto Rico, because I think once we, you know, strengthen those ties, make sure that uh, Puerto Rico as well is also included. All the time, Puerto Rico is, is an afterthought, barely. It's not really included in, in major proposals anywhere for a lot of things. So it's, it's I, I really want to be able to make sure that, that Puerto Rico is included in, in whatever major healthcare reform takes place in the United States. You know, this does not happen. Traditionally, it did not happen with the Affordable Care Act. A lot of the protections that were, that were supposed to be instituted under the Affordable Care Act were not extended to Puerto Rico. So it's, 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 it's part of, you know, that outreach. It's necessary to be able to make sure that people in Puerto Rico, as well as the people in the United States, you know, have better health care outcomes and a better health care system. Yes. And I want to emphasize one point. You said under the single payer system, you had constant improvement. And even today, well, if you just look at the graphs of the United States, what you'll discover is there was improvement until we started to privatize our system. So, you know, even today, if you look at the U.S. life expectancy, it's lower and has declined for like at least, I think, a decade, whereas the European countries it has gone up. Now it's slowed and COVID may have caused some decline. But as you point out, it just shows how ineffective our current healthcare system is. And I'm rambling a bit, but people need to be made aware of that. And one of the things which has fascinated me is I had no idea that Puerto Rico had essentially a single payer healthcare system. And, you know, you had something that was working well. And of course, we privatized it and make it much worse. It just drives me crazy sometimes. It's frustrating. And it's, it's definitely, you know, a lot of the people that lived under that system, particularly back in the Tata, you know, back when it was doing well, you know, they remember it fondly. You know, I've been able to talk to a lot of, Elderly people, quite frankly, you know, help me. My, my grandpa, for example, you know, he, he received services under that. And he was very poor growing up. And he, you know, didn't even have shoes when he was a kid. You know, he would walk to school barefoot. He would only have one pair of shoes. And he, you know, keep them in his hands. He'd walk barefoot to the school. He didn't want to get them muddy. Mm -hmm. or in the roads, goes to the school. And that's when he put on shoes. So it was, it was a totally different Puerto Rico. This is not the Puerto Rico uh that you see today you know a lot of things have changed and, but he remembers that system finally he says you know i remember you know my family hell we i only had a pair of shoes but i, I could go to a, a cdt i could go to a, a clinic to a hospital i wouldn't have to pay for that i would be able to receive those, those healthcare services i needed and, and this has been a common topic obviously it depends on who you talk to once you talk to people that live through the weakening of, of that system they'll tell you oh you, you know uh oftentimes they didn't have some medicines that we might have needed, stuff like that. Uh, but even then, it, you know, it all depends on the political leanings as well. Some people are going to say like, oh, no, that didn't work at all. And some other people are going to say like, you know, it wasn't perfect, but it, I, I had access, you know. A lot of people simply don't have access right now to healthcare services on the island. So uh, between 300,000 to 600,000 right now.
Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's 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 definitely a shame that we adopted the system that this simply just weakens our ability to improve healthcare outcomes here. Thirty, and literally, people die because they can't get the healthcare they need. I don't know. Again, I don't have statistics for Puerto Rico, but in the and I hate to say it this way because Puerto Rico is part of the United States, but in the mm -hmm. states in the District of Columbia, a report came out that estimated that 76,000 people die annually because they can't afford or can't get access to health care. Mm -hmm. And so here we're having this debate when the evidence is just clearly that a single payer system would save lives and save money. It would reduce the overall healthcare costs for the nation. So it's just amazing to me that these people keep arguing, oh, that a private system is better. It just enrages me. Look at the facts. Yeah. And, and you know, obviously, you know, within U.S. history, so oftentimes you'll hear people say, oh, you know, we can't implement this experiment throughout the United States all over the place. You know, you know, this has never been tried. But the thing is, here in Puerto Rico, you can't really even say that because we already had that system. You saw the, those tangible, you know, improvements in, in, in those metrics and that uh, particularly that access that people used to have. And now you don't. So it's, you know, this implementing single payer in Puerto Rico, obviously it will be different today if it were implemented for a variety of reasons, right? Uh, but, uh, you know, you don't have that public provision anymore that, that we used to have under the, the old system. But this wouldn't be an experiment. This is just returning to a tried and true formula that's been implemented not only in Puerto Rico previously, but also around the world. It worked here in Puerto Rico. It's worked in other locations. It's worked in, in, in Latin American countries. Costa Rica, for example, you know, they have single payer system, public provision of healthcare services, very similar. You know, the, we had our CDTs. They had uh, what they call advice, which is, you know, also an acronym will be longer, but it's the same, same system, same concept. It was, it was very similar in, in its functioning and they still have it. It's, it works properly. They have some of the best healthcare outcomes in, in all of Latin America. So this isn't some radical idea. This is simply a, a type of governance when it comes to the healthcare system that works and we know. It. So it, it just have to have the political will to influence. Yeah. And to build on that, you know, people say, well, how do we know this works? Because other countries are doing it. Mm -hmm. And every country, well, every wealthy country that are peer nations to the United States, or at least the states in the United States, mm -hmm. has better health outcomes than in the United States. It freaking works, people. It freaking <laughs> works. Yeah, it's, it's you know, there, there really isn't, there shouldn't be so much, right, uh, uh, opposition to what it is something that we know is functions and Hell, I mean, you mentioned it, right? Uh, talking about wealthy countries, but Costa Rica and Puerto Rico were very similar in, in a lot of aspects, obviously distinct in others. But the, the point is, we're not individually, right? We're not as rich as the United States, in the case of Puerto Rico, mainland, continental United States. We don't have as many resources, as much resources, as much money, but having that access has, even even if it's not, as comprehensive as one would desire, at having access to healthcare services has proven to improve healthcare outcomes. So the, the, the argument that, no, we can't implement that just by adding people, just by giving people coverage, you're already saving lives. And that's that's a fact. That's something that we know. And that that's there's, there's no reason why we should be debating this beyond, obviously, what, what you and I know, you know, our, our powerful interests, right? Here in Puerto Rico, it's a multi-billion you know billion dollar industry. And, and Puerto Rico is not necessarily a wealthy territory colony, right? But at the end of the day, having such a rich and successful industry, record profits. Just I think two years ago we had record profits here in Puerto Rico, and uh, when it comes to the to the private healthcare sector, which dominates Medicare, dominates Medicaid, uh, and obviously the other alternatives, either no insurance or private insurance. They're all the same plans, by the way. So Medicare Advantage. Has here in Puerto Rico, Medicare Advantage has a, a lot higher penetration than it does in the mainland United States. 
Uh, I think it's over 80% here on the island. In the United States, you can correct me, I think it's like 20% right now? No, it's actually closer to about, I think the last statistic I saw was, don't remember, but somewhere between like 42 and 46%. Okay, well, that's unfortunate. That's yes. that means it's higher than I thought. And uh, the, the medical advantage has been a waste of money, quite frankly, here in Puerto Rico, because also all these regulations, you know, again, technical aspects, but you have, you know, medical loss ratios, which were implemented under the Affordable Care Act. And, and I'll just explain it briefly. Medical loss ratio says, basically saying, hey, uh, private insurers, you know, these private plans, they need to invest a certain amount of money, more than 85%, if I'm not mistaken, of, of the amount of money they make in, in premiums into healthcare. If not, then that money is either reimbursed to the client, right? Because we're clients under this system, not patients, we're clients. It's either reimbursed to the client or if it's Medicare Advantage, it's reimbursed to the government. Uh, as long as you're either investing it in healthcare services or improving healthcare quality, that counts for that 85%. So the situation is here in Puerto Rico, there's, since they have to invest that money, but they are so stringent in and, 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 and spending it, you know, they really don't want to spend it. They're, they're really keeping that wallet close to the pocket. They're, they're, they don't want to pay for services. Then in order to comply with that medical loss ratio with, with those with those statutes from, from the Affordable Care Act, one of the few things that actually did apply to Puerto Rico from the Affordable Care Act, in order to comply with that, they're just literally handing money to uh, Medicare Advantage patients and saying, here you go, $500 monthly. You can use it to, you know, grooming for your dog, transportation, you can pay for gas. And hey, I'm not arguing against uh, more resources for the elderly. I want to make that very clear. But, but. We're talking about millions of dollars invested because there's a lot of people in, uh, under Medicare Advantage here, millions of dollars yearly invested in things that are not healthcare. And rather than strengthening, strengthening our healthcare system, we, we're just wasting money. So Medicare Advantage has been a waste of money here on the island. That's what unfortunately is most likely to happen in the United States as well if, if that continues expanding. Medicaid, it's all private plans as well. The government subcontracts as well. So, and, and those same private plans are also in the private market for, for private plans. So it's completely private. There's no real, real public sector. It's very limited here on the island. So privatization of healthcare services is not good. That's the, and that would be the most succinct way to state everything I just said. So before we end, is there anything that you would like to add? I think, you know, I, the biggest takeaway here uh, right, we, we had a good discussion regarding the history of the healthcare system, and Puerto Rico, how it kind of we saw that interplay between the United States government and our histories, uh, and how it resulted in our current system. I think the most important thing is that there's a growing movement in the United States that favors single payer, that favors universal universal healthcare. Here in Puerto Rico, we also have this sort of developing interest. People are starting to open up their eyes and realizing, hey, this doesn't work for me. You know, this simply does not work for me. It doesn't matter what the politicians say. I simply know as it's a fact. You know, I can't get appointments here. Puerto Rico. Getting appointments is, you know, a headache. People talk about universal healthcare having long appointments. Some some appointments here take over a year. You can wait two years to see a geneticist, for example. I mean it's 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 ridiculous. It's exaggerated. And the biggest takeaway is people are starting to realize this doesn't work. There's a movement in the United States, there's a movement in Puerto Rico. Uh, we have to work together uh, to achieve, you know, our goal of improving healthcare outcomes in the United States, improving healthcare outcomes in Puerto Rico, and making sure that we have a universal healthcare system in, in both places. You know, I'm not bringing in the political status, whether independence or your statehood or whatever. You know, I'm not, I'm not going into that. The most important thing is people, you know, people's health. And if we work together, I know there's a lot of well-intentioned people in the United States. It's important to keep, keep Puerto Rico in mind, realize that, yes, we can be discriminated against, unfortunately. We've seen it. But let's make sure to, you know, rectify those mistakes. Let's make sure that we move forward and, and include Puerto Rico and, and work together to improve healthcare outcomes for everybody. Well, I will second that. And let <laughs> me just say, I'm an activist for Medicare for All, and I consider myself well-informed. And I had absolutely no idea of the history of Puerto Rico or what's going on there. And, you know, I hope I can help. I hope I can help coordinate and get 
Puerto Rico and the United States working together. It'd be great for the population of both, I don't know how to put it, of both areas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because I, part, I part. want to say it'd be great for the population. Well, it'd be great for the population of the United States, which, of course, yeah. Puerto Rico is a part of. Yeah. It's it's a, one of those, uh, that's a whole other, that could be a whole other podcast. But yeah, the important thing is, as I mentioned, people. And yeah, definitely. I really appreciate it. And, I, and I'm glad, you know, that that's the point of, of having these conversations, be able to get the dialogue started. I'm really glad that people are going to be able to learn through this podcast as well, a little bit about the history of Puerto Rico and about our healthcare system. So uh, I hope people found it interesting, at least, and it motivates them, right, to do some good. Well, I certainly found it interesting. Carlo, thank you so much for being on Medicare for All Explained. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. You have been listening to Medicare for All Explained. Remember to tell your family, friends, and colleagues about this podcast. Information about Medicare for All Explained can be found at our website, medicareforallexplained.org. The music for this show is Super Bubbly by Jesse Spillane. The logo was created by Lily Sparks. Thank you for listening.